My name is Yves Dewat. I am an operation engineer working for the European Space Agency. A spacecraft can be a satellite orbiting a planet or an object, or a vehicle traveling through the solar system. The spacecraft control depends on the control center, a network of antennas distributed around the Earth, a communication network connecting the control center to the antennas, and of course, the communication between the antennas and the spacecraft for sending command and receiving telemetry. Earth observation missions are flying South Pole to the North Pole, back down to the South Pole, and again the North Pole. And as you can see, with each orbit, the spacecraft will fly above a different region of the Earth. Where do I put my antenna? Very simple. The best location will be either the North Pole or the South Pole. Geostationary spacecraft are flying above the Earth, above the equator, at an altitude of 36,000 km. At this altitude, the spacecraft will make a turn around the Earth in 24 hours, which is exactly the same speed as the Earth's rotation. So always in visibility of the same point on the Earth. In that case, Antenna can be located in the North Hemisphere or in the South Hemisphere. In the case of deep space, the spacecraft will fly far away from the Earth. And you can see, in that case, while the Earth is rotating, the spacecraft remains practically at the same position. So we will need several antennas around the Earth and their location will ensure the correct coverage of the mission. And in that way, we have a nice coverage of our missions, deep space or around the Earth. My name is René Lippmann and I work as a spacecraft operations engineer for ESA's Prober mission in Ritu. Of course, I believe that satellites will become more autonomous. Prober stands for Project for Onboard Autonomy and our mission's main goal is to demonstrate that satellites are able of controlling themselves. They do so today, much in the same way as a self-driving car. You still need to decide where you want to go, and you need a driver. But on the highway, the car will run but on its own. For our satellites, this means nominal operations are taken care of by the satellite. You don't need an operator to command the instruments. However, in case of anomalies, you still need the team to investigate what went wrong. Let's take Prober-V as an example. The mission constantly monitors the health of plants on Earth. To do this, it takes photos when flying above the land. For an older mission, you would have to calculate when the satellite is in the sun and flying over an interesting area and program the camera to turn on and off again. Prober-V takes care of this all by itself. It is equipped with GPS receivers, similar to the ones in your smartphone, and a so-called Land Sea Mask. That is a special kind of map that allows the satellite to determine if it is flying above land or ocean and accordingly turn cameras on and off by itself. Well, the truth is, even though satellites are highly developed machines flying in space, they're still just a computer and not able to cope with the unknown all by themselves. In case of an anomaly, you need a team of experts on ground to investigate and find a solution for the problem and in the best cases, we even managed to reprogram the satellite and mission control system to resolve the same problem automatically in the future, thus still improving the autonomy of the satellite. Hello, my name is Armel Lubo and I am a spacecraft operations engineer at the European Space Operations Center in Darmstadt, Germany. Well, the first step is to receive a message, a report from our space debris office telling us that we risk a collision. It will tell us exactly at what time it's going to happen, the chances for this to happen, is it one over 100, one over 1000, and it will tell us the near miss distance. Are we going to fly as close as a few tens of meters, a few kilometers? And this is important information 
because with it we decide if we want to do a maneuver or not. Another thing which is important to know is what the other object is. Is it a space debris? In which case it's easy, we just do the maneuver. Or is it another live spacecraft? This is a bit more tricky because in this case chances are that the other satellites will also know that we're coming and will also try to avoid us. And if everyone is doing a maneuver at the same time, we do not want to both move to the same place and risk a collision again. The idea is that either we move away from each other or only one of the two is moving away. So this is something that we have to discuss with the other agency, with the people who are flying the other spacecraft. And once it has been decided that we are the ones who are going to move, we need to ask our colleagues from navigation, the experts who calculate the trajectory and the maneuvers of spacecraft, to do a calculation for this maneuver, which means how long are we going to fire the thrusters and in which direction. And then once this is done, we also need to check the new orbit in which we're going to move. Are there going to be space debris there? Because if we move from a dangerous orbit into an even more dangerous one, then we have gained nothing. So when we have all this information, once we are sure that the trajectory, the new trajectory is good, we uplink the commands to the spacecraft, we perform the maneuver, verify that it executed as planned, and then we're done. Hi everyone, my name is Pete Collins, and I work for ESA at the European Space Operations Centre in Darmstadt, in Germany. This is Gaia right here, or at least a model of her. Just over two years ago, uh, we, we had a problem, we had a, a big anomaly in flight where we, we had a failure of an onboard unit. Um, we actually had a failure of some, some of the electronics inside. And she, she was able to notice that she had a problem and she switched to her, her redundant units, her backup units on board, um, and, and said, this, this unit's broken, I'm not going to use it anymore. Um, when she did that though, that, that meant that she wasn't able to carry on the normal mission and she wasn't able to carry on doing the, the science mission that she was designed for. So that's where the team that I work on came in, the flight control team, of which I'm a part, and we came in and we had to, uh, to figure out what the problem was um, and how to fix it in the short term to get the science mission running again. The problem with that is it's not like um, like going to fix a broken car or something like that where you can actually go and touch it, you can use the screwdrivers, you can open the bonnet, you can have a look. With Gaia she's quite a long way away, she's one and a half million kilometres away so it takes five seconds for a signal to, uh, to Gaia to, to reach us on Earth. Um, so they were a bit limited and we have to look at the, uh, the data coming from, from Gaia being sent through space to ground. We look at things like temperatures, voltages, currents, uh, data from other sensors. Um, and we did this as a team and we discussed together and we were able to, to fairly quickly understand, understand uh, what happened and, and bring Gaia back to, uh, back to full performance, performing her science again. And we were able to do this within a couple of days. So it was a really intense period, we were working long hours. The most interesting bit for me was, as well as the technical, technical details, was was the coming together of everybody and, and the teamwork of these many, many different people and many different organisations all working in different parts of the world. It's a privilege to work for ESA because one of, one of the great things is, is, is its distribution of people and the different types of people from different backgrounds and all coming together to work together. And that was, for me, one of the, one of the main achievements of this critical phase uh, that I've just spoken to you about.